I'm generally just going to start by trying to plug in the X value. I'll do the easy part. The bottom part's zero. What do you get when you plug in three on top? I know we can't divide by zero, but in calculus, this just means we have more work to do. So what do we get on the top? Zero. We do. And zero over zero is one of our most popular and interesting limits in calculus. Question? Why is it zero? So I'll go ahead and actually show the plugging in part on the top. So when I plug in three, I've got three squared plus three times three minus 18 all over three minus three. So on top, I've got nine plus nine, which gives me 18. And then minus 18, I'm back to zero. Zero over zero from a calculus perspective says, go do some algebra. And in general, those three algebra things I'm gonna be looking for are factoring, multiplying by conjugates, finding common denominators. Here, I'm thinking about factoring. Does anyone see how the top factors? Factors? Yeah. I will give you all a clue. Um, there's a thing called the Euclidean algorithm. It's stuff you do in upper division math classes. Upshot is that if I get zero over zero, the top and the bottom have to have a factor in common. Wait, what? So they have to have the same factor? If you get zero over zero, the top and the bottom had to have a factor that's the same. Since the bottom is just X minus three, I know the top has to be X minus three times something. And I got an answer in the chat, X plus six. Now, I think it's a nice jump start if you already know what one of the factors is, which is why I pointed that out. Here's what happens. That means that if I'm thinking about this function, the function f of x, x squared plus 3x minus 18 over x minus 3, it's basically the same as the function x plus six, except at exactly x equals three, it's undefined. From a limits perspective, that x minus three over x minus three cancels out. And when I take this limit, and I put three in, three plus six, I get nine. So the answer to the limit is nine, even though initially it looked like we were gonna get zero over zero. Question or comment? Uh, yeah. yeah, question. So in Peter's class yesterday, he was talking about how if you have something similar to this, you divide both of them by the smallest um, degree polynomials. So is that what that is? I am, um, well, essentially, I, I have two answers. While I haven't looked at those notes, my guess is you were looking at limits as x approaches infinity, not a number. But okay. if we were looking at x approaches a number, you could think about this as dividing by the polynomial x minus 3. Okay. But I don't think that's what he was doing. I no. think you were doing limits to infinity. Because he only did the, like, say it was like x cubed plus blah, blah, blah. And yes. on the bottom it had like x squared dot yes. whatever else. Then you would only divide by the x squared. Correct. He was doing limits to infinity. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. for sure. For sure. Okay. So what does that mean graphically? This means I we're not looking at asymptotes here. We're actually looking at a hole in the graph. If I were to sketch this out, this rational function is actually secretly x plus six in disguise. 
but it's x plus six in disguise and a hole at x equals three. Now that hole in the graph has coordinates of three comma nine. Because the answer to a limit problem doesn't have to be the actual y value. It just has to be what does it look like y is headed towards as x is headed towards that number. But you couldn't touch it though. So I can't touch it. That's why I've got a hole. So it's just like, oh, we're going to stop, disappear, and then start on the other side? Yep. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to use some vocabulary because it's in the book, and I don't know whether anyone's going to see it, but I definitely in the past have seen it show up on web work homework. This is what's called a removable discontinuity. Because of exactly the point you just made that we're like walking along this graph and we get almost exactly up to that point we skip over exactly one point and then we just keep going like normal and to remove the discontinuity we could turn this into a piecewise function and just define what the value was at that hole so I could write this, that that's my function everywhere except at x equals three. And then at x equals three, we would just define our function to be the number nine. And the, you know, I x equals three over. because that's the limit given? Yes. Okay, and then we just found the y value. Yep. Just algebra. <laughs> it's just algebra. Okay. Limits with algebra. That's what we're doing. Okay. Let's talk about the other, some of the other kinds of algebra that are going to show up for us. Why can't we're going to come back to limits at infinity? I promise. Oh no, no. Oh. I was just asking. So, if the whole polynomial equation can't equal three, but why out the 9x can be? Is that because it's part of the limit and that's the only place it can be? This is not part of my original question. Oh, okay. Right? Like the question was just find the limit, right? I have seen this show up on web work. So I'm just trying to put it out there in case anyone's doing web work homework over the weekend and it shows up. Okay. Um, so when we have a hole in the graph then we call that a removable discontinuity and we can fill the hole back in by making it a piecewise function uh, I, I don't know because people like stuff to be busy work <laughs> I, I would say from a calculusy perspective if I want my function to be defined at every single x value, this isn't defined at three. But my piecewise function is defined at three. Yeah. There is no asymptote in this problem. If I have a hole, I don't have an asymptote. But that's a good question. What's the difference between an asymptote and a hole? So, um, Lots of questions coming through about asymptotes. So let's talk asymptotes for a second. We did it. We did some of these on Tuesday. So I'd encourage you to go look back at the notes from Tuesday um, if you want more examples. But a lot of rational functions, like let me come up, uh, let's say two plus x over x minus one. If you are willing to believe me, I'm just gonna graph this for us really quick. This has a horizontal asymptote at one. 
This has a vertical asymptote at one. Sorry, I shouldn't have made those the same. Um, this is a function that, like it or not, your calculus instructor thinks you can graph using pre-calculus skills. So like it or not, your calculus instructor thinks you can do that. Now, your pre-calculus skill might be putting it into Desmos. That's OK. Yes. That can be your pre-calc skill. Question. We're going to go back to that in a second. Right now, you're just trusting me because right now I'm using pre-calculus skills to graph this thing, not calculus. This thing looks like um, this. This thing has a vertical asymptote and a horizontal asymptote. Yep. Horizontal asymptotes at one, yes. So using my pre-calculus skills and only my pre-calculus skills, I know that this vertical asymptote is at x equals one because it's the value that makes the denominator undefined. Using only my pre-calculus skills, I know that the horizontal asymptote is at y equals one, either from doing long division or from looking at the largest powers of x on the top and the bottom, seeing that they match and stealing the coefficients. That's typically how you would have done that in pre-calculus. Like, now we're gonna do the calculus version of both of those. Okay, so like long division, it's just the, like the polynomial long division? Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. I can do that. I totally. Know. So using pre-calculus skills, we ought to be able to get both of those. Using pre-calculus skills, I also ought to be able to find the intercepts. My y-intercept happens from plugging in 0 for x. And I got 2 over negative 1. So I had like 0 comma negative 2. My x-intercept comes from setting y equals 0. And my numerator is zero when x is equal to negative two. So I like made this graph way more symmetric than I meant to, but that's okay. Let's sprinkle on the calculus now. If I were to ask you without the graph and just with the function, to find the vertical asymptotes. The question that that is asking you is one, to identify what makes the denominator equal to zero. Those are my candidates. But that's not enough. It isn't a vertical asymptote unless the graph is headed straight up or straight down. So after I've determined what values make the denominator equal to zero, I then have to take the limit as I approach those values. Why does the denominator affect the vertical asymptotes? Um, I'll show you in a second. Then show the limit approaches positive or negative infinity. Okay, so graphically, if I'm thinking about the vertical asymptote, Right, graphically, if I'm thinking about this from limits, first of all, there's only one x value that makes the denominator equal to zero, and that's x equals one. So if I think about this as a limit question, and I'm looking at 
the limit as x approaches one for my function. The first thing I'm gonna try with the limit problem is to plug the value in. When I plug in one, I get three on the top and I get zero on the bottom. On Tuesday, we talked a little bit about three divided by zero is actually a really huge number. So if I had not quite zero, but something really, really close to zero, like maybe one over a thousand, then three divided by one over a thousand is actually three times a thousand over one or 3,000. So the closer the bottom gets to actually zero, the smaller and smaller this gets, the more zeros I end up with out here. So as X gets close to zero, this number is getting really, really big. I'm gonna connect that to the graph and then come back to your question. So if I'm thinking about that from the graphical perspective, the answer to a limit is where y is headed. So if I start on the graph, pretty close to one, because that's the x value my limit is going towards. If I start on the graph pretty close to one, and I get closer and closer to one, these y values are headed up to positive infinity. If I come from the other side of one and I start over here, these values are headed to negative infinity. And since the answer to a limit problem is what the y value is trying to get to, the answer to my limit problem here is either positive infinity or negative infinity. Now I'll take your question. It's different now. Um, okay. So, based off of what you just said, isn't it? Um, Whichever y is approaching faster, that's what our limit is. So if positive infinity is approaching faster, then negative infinity. I am sure those words came out of someone's mouth in lecture, and yes. it is not related to this problem. Oh Though I am happy to connect those words to something, not relevant for this problem. Okay, I thought it was. What is relevant for this problem is. If I get a number divided by zero, I have a vertical asymptote as long as that number was not zero. Zero over zero, special case. Some other number over zero, we're talking about a vertical asymptote. And in the context of limits, we will often then have to break that apart to look from the left and the right. And that's how I'm going to know which way I'm going. So I'm going to write this as the limit as x approaches one from the left. And from the left, my function is going to look like 3 over 0, but my 0 is going to be, if I'm on the left-hand side of 1, it's going to be a little bit negative, which means I'm headed to negative infinity. If I take the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, I'm still on the screen? I am. Okay. That's three over zero still, but it's a slightly positive zero and I'm headed to positive infinity. Either way, I can conclude that X equals one is a vertical asymptote. Now I wanna bring that back to the problem we just did. So on the previous problem, we took the limit as x approached the value that made the denominator equal to zero. But when we took the limit, we got zero over zero, which told us to do some more work. So we did some algebra. And at the end of that algebra, the answer to our limit was not positive or negative infinity. 
This is not a vertical asymptote. This is a hole. Here we conclude there is a hole at x equals three, not a vertical asymptote. So just because you get zero in the denominator doesn't mean that we had a vertical asymptote. Now, maybe in pre-calc, you only saw problems where a zero in the denominator meant you had a vertical asymptote. But in calculus, we're going to see both, which is why we have to do the limit to determine after we work algebra and the limit, do we get a number or do we get a vertical asymptote because we get a number divided by zero? Okay, so after we do the algebra, then if it still has a zero in the denominator, that's when it's going to... Yep. Okay. That's... Okay. Can I see the box? Yep. Thank you. Um, should we also talk about the horizontal asymptote for this one? Um, and I know there was a, to watch in the chat. Okay, it's about 10, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna flip the page here. We've got y equals two plus x over x minus one. Two plus x over x minus one. And this time I'm looking to find the horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes. Okay, question in the chat, thrilling conclusion. If you have a number divided by zero, as long as that number is not zero, you do have a vertical asymptote. Zero over zero, we wanna be careful, do some algebra first. Um, there's also a question in the chat about practice exams. Here's the deal. I can make practice exams, but I can only make them as good as what I know about your midterm, which at this moment is not a lot or to that. So once you all have a study guide and you send that to me, I can turn that into a practice midterm. Okay. For Chalinor, I've been watching Canvas. There's a folder that says it's going to be a midterm review. There's nothing in it, at least as of this morning. So once there's something in there, I'm totally happy to make some um, review problems, practice exam. Yeah. Okay, back to this. Horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes are what's happening on the edges of the graph. Or we talk about the limiting behavior, or we talk about the end term behavior, right? But either way, here we're thinking about what happens when X gets really, really big, either towards positive infinity or negative infinity. As a limit problem, this means we are always looking for the limit as X approaches infinity. And I'm gonna be careful here. They do not have to be the same value. So sometimes we've gotta consider the limit as X approaches negative infinity. If you get a number for an answer, that number is the horizontal asymptote. But how would we know if it's not the hole? <laughs> Unless it specifically asks to find an asymptote. I'm not ever gonna find a hole from a horizontal asymptote. Is it? So a hole happens at a specific X value. So if I think about this, uh, let me finish my sentence first, but if you get a number for the answer, that number is the horizontal asymptote. So if I think about just like generally a rational function, um, I'm just gonna call this top and bottom. The denominator where it's equal to zero is either going to lead 
to a hole or a vertical asymptote. But a horizontal asymptote is always the limit as x approaches positive infinity or negative infinity. So for this particular question, if I want to find that horizontal asymptote, I am looking to take the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 plus x over x minus 1. I'm going to do the pre-calc version of this super quick. Pre-calc version of this might look like two polynomial long division, meaning I would have two plus X on the inside, but I got to rewrite that as X plus two because I'm not that clever to do polynomial long division. I need my X's first. And if I do this, I look at the X and I say X times what equals X. That's a one. I multiply the one down. So I'd have X minus one. I subtract that whole thing. X minus X is zero. Two minus negative one is positive three. And I write the answer by saying X plus two over X minus one is equal to one plus three divided by X minus one. If I do this, thinking about a horizontal asymptote as a limit and why we were able to use this trick in pre-calc, as X gets really huge, what's three divided by a bajillion? I know a bajillion is not really a number. What's three divided by a trillion? Teeny, teeny, tiny, right? It's almost zero which means as X gets really big, this is one plus zero. My horizontal asymptote is one. That's the pre calc version. I didn't say equals one plus. Oh, because that's the- That's my problem. remainder. Okay, okay. Sorry, I'm just like No worries. That's our remainder. Okay, so this is like the pre-calc version. Which, fun fact, you will get full credit on the test. If you really like the pre-calc version, you can do the pre-calc version. But if these questions get messy, that's going to take more time than our calculus version. Our calculus version looks like this. I'm going to take the largest power of x in the denominator, specifically the denominator, always the denominator. I'm going to take the largest power of x in the denominator and divide every term by it. Wait, this is to look for the same exact thing. Looking for the same exact thing. Yep. Largest power of x in the denominator. Why am I looking for the largest power of X? Because that's the thing that's gonna to go to infinity the fastest. That's where that phrase would have come up. Oh, okay. So I'm looking for the largest power of X and it matters here because I'm headed to infinity. That part of it doesn't matter if X is going to a number, but it matters if X is going to infinity. So I'm gonna take every term and divide by X. I would have two over X, plus x over x, x over x, minus one over x. I'm gonna show this two ways. This is not the way Chalinor showed it, but we're gonna end up in the same place. I'll do it Chalinor's version in a second. Now that I'm here, as x approaches infinity, a number divided by infinity is headed to zero. So this looks like, zero, x over x is equal to one, x over x is equal to one again, 
and one over X is going to zero. So my answer is one. The other option, instead of dividing by the largest power of X in the denominator, is to factor out the largest power of X in the denominator. I've gone back and forth with this over the years of which one I like better, but I'm gonna show this other one real quick. So if instead I were to factor out the biggest power of X in the denominator, again, kind of going back to, sorry. Thank you. I'm um, going back to this limit. If I pull an X out of the top, I'm gonna to be left with two over X plus one because distributing the X back in would get me to where I started. Same thing in the bottom. If I pull an X out, I'll have one minus one over X. Same end result. X over X is equal to one. And when I look at the limit, two over X is going to zero. One is just one. And one over X is also going to zero. So this is just two different versions to do the same thing. Pick the one you like. If I have $2 and I try to share it with everyone in California, I have no, no one has any money. It's just such a small number. It's basically zero. Yeah. Um, I am almost out of time. So super, super quick recap. A number divided by zero is positive or negative infinity. This guy's a vertical asymptote. Zero divided by a number is actually zero. Good times. Zero divided by zero says go do some algebra. It might be a whole. And infinity over infinity also says go do some algebra. This usually shows up with horizontal asymptotes. 